as I was saying, I, I, I feel I'm in that Chicago theater about to be shot. <laughs> Just don't dust any paintings, you'll be fine. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the podcast, because I think many of you out here know their work on the screen, but one of the most incredible things that the two of you have been doing for the last while is this incredible series of discussions with filmmakers. Um, can you talk about why you started doing it and sort of the place it holds in your lives? Well, we started doing it after we were doing some um, publicity for 1917 because we would do these question Q and A's afterwards and then get asked the same questions and I thought, oh, well, maybe we do a podcast and, and just answer it. But then as we, and then lockdown came, so we had plenty of time. <laughs> and then as we s started doing it, it sort of developed on its own because it did become conversations and it, it was fun for us too because we were getting to ask all these questions that were, were kind of naturally curious. So we got to ask all these questions like, how do you do what you do and why do you do it that way? And it just kind of roller coastered and then we, s decided we'd stop because we had to do 1917, so, Empire. yeah, Empire of Light, sorry, you're right. <laughs> and um, we were out in the world again, suddenly, and people were saying, oh, I really like the podcast, so we went, uh-oh, we gotta do it again. I trapped. <laughs> I have I've seen a pattern on the the show where the guests always want to ask you two questions too, which happens every time. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your communication on set because uh, you collaborate on all your projects, and it's been kind of a great thing to see the last couple of days. You've been working with a lot of students, and you have this sort of shorthand between the two of you. Um, a few of my crew members noticed it, how I think it was described as, you talk without talking. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration on set and sort of what, what you enjoy about it? Well, I... Being I, together. Yeah. <laughs> we like being together. I actually really love solving problems. That's always been what I've liked to do. So there's plenty of problems on a film set. And um, basically my aim is to allow Roger to just be looking through the camera and, and into whatever he's shooting. And I'm dealing with everything else that might be coming up that day or next week or the following week. And I think also, you know, since we work together and live together. Um, yeah, we have, don't have to talk so much yeah, anymore. Yeah, it was in <laughs> interesting on this film as well because at the same time we were trying to time Jarhead that we'd done with Sam Mendes. So James was going back and forth to LA. I was going back at weekends while we were shooting, which was a bit awkward, you know, to time Jarhead and stuff. So it's, it's a huge amount to do on some films. I was just thinking of that one. Yeah, the thing is that working with him, I, it, I don't have his eye, but I know what it is that he wants. So when we were doing this one and I would go into LA during the, the week to try and you know, keep track of the, the grade or the timer to make sure, because a lot of times they go off on their own path and to bring it back to what he wanted because I knew what he wanted and then he'd come on the weekends and we'd go a little further and then I would come back and um, supervise it. So it was interesting. I've noticed also this week that you, you, you guys seem to have, like with the shorthand, be on the same page, but I'm curious what happens when you disagree? <laughs> I win. No. <laughs> Yeah, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> we, we generally, though, don't I, disagree I, that much. I'm just trying to think when we had last. Yeah. Not um, really. We don't... Well, I think because before we even accept a job, we read the script together or separately, but then we talk about it. So we kind of go into it with the same ideas. And as you go through and prep, that's the whole time where you're figuring out what it is and it goes back and forth and back and forth, but we're doing it together so we basically have the same viewpoint. Right. And Roger, um, and you did make films before you and James got <laughs> together. Um, how's your process changed since you have started collaborating with James? Well, it was, it, it just, 
it just happened slowly. I mean, while well, we, we were still shooting film and timing on film, it just happened slowly that James became more and more involved and started giving up scripting because that sort of made us apart. And then I think when the DI came across, you know, when the sort of the post-production started to get more and more complicated, and, and uh, especially when we started shooting with the digital camera, I mean, it just there's so much more that needs to be overseen, you know. But it also it it means that you don't you can focus on what's in front of you, and and sometimes also when post is happening, when you're in the middle of the next shoot. There are a lot of things that you really have to follow through on the post. And to try and do that and shoot at the same time is really hard. Well, I just think of this film, and this was shot on film. And, um, you know, it was a very tough schedule, you know. I mean, actually, you know, James was helping keep me sane, you know. I mean, it was a very hard it's shoot. A hard I mean, job on know, that one. It was one. a hard job. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's you're spending the whole day concentrating, and I operate, right? So. I'm there with my key people and uh, uh, on set, and just it's it's a very frantic shoot. That that was particularly that's the short version. You should have seen the long version, <laughs> which I actually love, but it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Is there any talk of it coming back? I know everyone talks no, about no. the mythical. Uh, Andrew's quite happy with this version, but I'm 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 sort of partly joking. We did see the first the first cut. It wasn't a rough cut. It was a cut. And it was like, well, it was nearly four hours, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was close, yeah. But it was really, it was really beautiful. I mean, um, most of what's, what's being taken out is after Jesse James is killed. And it follows Bob Ford and it follows uh, Z, Jesse James's wife, you go to the funeral. And, and uh, Frank. Someone tried to assassinate Z at the funeral and that forest. Frank, you know, Sam Shepard, who who took tourists around his ranch up in New England somewhere. And they would pay to see the great outlaw and his living on this ranch. And it's all these little details of life. And that, I mean, I'm going on now. That's what I love about the film. It brings in the whole sense of history and passing and the connections. And um, I sort of regret it's not there, but the book still exists. The book that the film is based on, The Assassination of Jesse James, by, the, by Ron Hansen, is very much what the film is. It's the, all those sort of textuals of that period. Mm. It's really interesting. I also think that um, the studio had a hard time thinking, well, what is the story after Brad Pitt dies? I mean, it, the, and yet that was in the title that it was about I mean, Bob. It, it, it's up, we built this creed was built up in the Rockies. I mean, it's, the whole town was built for the film. And it's amazing. And there was this great big kind of like big bridge over this canyon. And, and Bob Ford had an affair with this other woman, this other girl, well, an older woman. And there were all these kind of existentialist conversations. And anyway, eventually she committed suicide off this bridge. I mean, it's all fact. It's all true. And it's all those sort of all that color and nuance, I, I really kind of miss it myself, but there. And it, and it really was a film about um, Bob and, and, and about this need to be famous and, and then getting it and it not giving him what he thought it would. Mm. So it was a more interesting film that way. Mm. Yeah, as, it, as you were saying that about all the other characters, it, it has this sort of ensemble feel to it at certain points in the film. And then you have, you know, who's the main character? Is it Bob? Is it Jesse? But then, you know, in watching it again today, uh, I watched it again this week as well, it feels like an unconventional love story as well between the two of them. I think that there's the moment where Jesse says, you know, I'm not sure if you want to be like me or you want to be me. And I feel like that that was a, a central theme throughout the film. And um, we're going to dive into it because I know that you work very much off of story. And that's sort of what drives your choices. But before we get to that, how did you get involved with this project to begin with? I know you, you said you read through the script, you sort of decide together. What was it about this project that made you excited to work on it? I don't know where it came from. I mean, Andrew just approached me, but I, I have no idea. I have no idea why. I mean, I didn't know him before. Um, but, but I mean, you know, I read the book and, and I was just kind of, hey, come on, it's just a beautiful, beautiful piece. And I love films that are not sort of linear narratives, that they're 
you know, this one's almost a tone poem of an age, you know, and I'm, 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 I love westerns, I love Sam Peckinpah westerns, and I feel oh, stylistically that it's kind of different, but in try, what it's trying to say and the world it's trying to present and the idea of the world changing and you can't stop it and Jesse James realizes he's kind of, he's outlived his time. Well, that's very much the wild bunch, but just told in a very different way, you know. Um, James, you said to me this week that uh -oh. you're the kind of person that is always moving forward, that you don't like looking back. You're laughing. I was listening. <laughs> I, <did say> <laughs> um, I feel like that's you know true of your life and your work together. And I think the two of you are also known for embracing the new, like your your um, the new technology is going to digital. And there was some really interesting choices that you two made in this film in terms of the look of it. Can you talk a little bit about? the deaconizers and how they were developed and sort of, you know, the, the very unique things about this film in terms of its look. Well, it's very what they are. Yeah, it's very much Andrew. I mean, he, he, he had a, I mean, and a lot of it comes from the book, the feeling of the book, but Andrew had very, very, um, very well thought out idea of what he wanted of the film, the look of the characters, that they're all wore black, you know, that all the horses were black, which wasn't easy at night when you're trying to shoot. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, and yeah, the deaconize as well. I mean, it was sort of was logically a, a way of recreating the sort of effect of a pinpoint camera, you know, pinhole camera. And the final f image of Jesse James that actually exists, well, there's two images of him that actually exist, exist. And it was trying to get that. And both of us actually, when we were watching the cut together in a cutting room, both of us regretted we didn't use it more, that effect. Um, we started off just using it so sort of for the link pieces, so it became kind of you know the postcards between different scenes or setting up a different location. And the studio w got back to us when they were watching dailies and said, "Can you please not use that all the time?" <laughs> and, and and I think it made us kind of we sort of censored ourselves a bit, and we both regret it at the end. You know, it's a shame. But the thing too about the lenses is it wasn't something that you could do in post because what it's doing to the colors as well as the focus Chromatic was... Chromatic aberration. Yes. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. I'm not very technical. <laughs> <laughs> For the, the members of the audience who don't know, can you talk a little bit about how you made the lenses, how you built well, them? Well, it was years ago I was doing a, a, a cinema short in London and then I took apart a stills lens and took an element, a front element of Stills lens and put it on the front of a, a in front of my 50 mil on a, on a 35 mil camera and got that kind of effect. That was years and years ago. So when Andrew said, well, let's try and replicate this sort of pinhole sort of look, uh, I took that idea to, well, we took the idea to Otto Nemitz, who's a camera rental house that I've always used in LA. And um, yeah, and they tried the same thing and made up some lenses that were doing it. We had three different lenses, didn't we? And then after the movie, they you know, called me up and said, um, do you mind if we rent them? <laughs> you know, and they yeah. do, they rent them and in we LA. We use them on commercials, oh, God knows why. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that you regretted not using them more. Um, when did you decide to use them? Like when, you know, like, do you know certain shots you were gonna use them or just like, throw them on, get the shot, or? Well, I'd say the kind of linking shots, you know, um, when Bob's riding towards the farmhouse, when he, a lot of those landscapes, you know, the interstitials with the kind of voiceover, um, you know, the, the rocking chair and that. And we also use swing and tilt lenses, which probably people know that shift the plane of focus. Um, you know, there's different ways to just not make it look like a painting, but deliberately make it look like a picture. In fact, usually I don't like that. Usually I, I think I want the audience to be totally immersed in the image, but this was a way of saying, no, this is a portrait of a past, you know? Well, and it also, because the language of the book was so lyrical and it was going to be used as voiceover, it kind of steered the movie in a diff yeah. slightly different direction. It does go with the language, doesn't yeah, it? I mean, yeah. listening to it again, I, th I find the, the, the language, language is, is just yeah. extraordinary, beautiful. And it's also a wavy glass, also fits yeah, with Yeah, we did yeah. things like that. We, we deliberately, um, actually it wasn't, we got, we got some period glass, but actually what they did, I got the painter to get some varnish and paint over the glass to make those waves. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, it was interesting how you used the wavy glass both to shoot through 
And then there's also the textures on the back wall that are a little reminiscent of, of In Cold Blood and also made me think a little bit about the water ceilings in Blade Runner 2049. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess yeah. so, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. yeah. But, but also, as Roger was saying, Andrew, the director, is also very visual. And so he kind of, he had his vision in his head. And sometimes when you work with the director and they say, okay, I want the scene to be dark, uh, there are different definitions of dark. And on the train sequence, when you said to him, you know, you're all right with this being dark, and he says, yes, you know, being mm. pitch black is fine. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because watching it now, there's no cut in that when you push in from behind Brad and then the, it's black and then the train starts coming. It's actually one shot. There's not cut in it. I was thinking, why didn't they cut? We could have done it separately. But. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk more about the train sequence, sequence in a minute. Um, Sorry, we're taking you out of oh, order. Oh, no, no, you're Sorry. good. You're good. I'm going to go on it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Roger from this week, too, because I know he loves it. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> this week you said in a few different ways. You said there's a million ways to do something and they're all right and they're all wrong. <laughs> Probably all wrong. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, because as you said a lot this week too, it's about the play. It's about the collaboration. It's about sort of following your gut in the moment. So the story is obviously a huge influencing factor on how this film looks. Um, there's so much of the the emotional action that needs to be captured in the faces of these actors. I mean, it's just the, the performances mm. with Casey and Brad are just incredible. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the choices that you made in this film were motivated by the story and sort of you know, how you worked through those? Well, I mean, we had a lot of time. We're not, we didn't have a huge, mm. long prep, but we had a, had time scouting locations and talking. I mean, this is basically shot in, in Calgary, up in the Rockies there, in Edmonton and, and um, Winnipeg. So it's quite diverse places we were shooting. So we did spend quite a bit of time, you know, scouting these places and driving around, um, trying to find remote locations. And, and it's all that time, you're just talking about it, talking about it, there's not el nothing else you're gonna be doing. And then <clears throat> we had time in the office, you know, sketching ideas, working with a storyboard artist, and, um, and we all got images that we thought were kind of relevant to different scenes in the film. So by the time we came close to shooting in the, in the corridor of the production office, you could walk down the hallway and kind of see the movie as you went down. Not, not, no images were exactly, this gonna look like this, gonna look like this, but the sort of feel of it, the kind of color of it, and just the whole feel of it. Um, I remember Andrew had some Polaroids he'd taken, I mean, years ago, just old faded Polaroids, and just odd things that kind of like, yeah, I mean, they, they hold the essence of the film in them, but they're not strictly, you know, you couldn't say, oh, that looks exactly like that frame, nothing like that, you know. I feel like this is film is also a study of contrasts. Like you have the, the white, white snow and the black horses and the black costumes. And um, one of my favorite contrasts is when Jesse goes to Ed, Ed Miller's house, which is this just like falling apart kind of rat's nest. Mm -hmm. And Jesse comes in and he's wearing this you know, beautiful costume and all black and you lit him so softly in the most beautiful way. And to me, that soft light on his face with the set is such an incredible contrast. But I feel like that, that was a theme throughout the film was these contrasts. Well, that scene in particular, that was interesting actually, because yeah. when we got with that, we had built that hut on location so we could shoot Jesse coming down the hill and all that and coming into the hut. And there was like, literally two foot of snow on the ground because it was like late in our schedule so we couldn't we tried to dig it out but then we thought well how are we going to do that the whole hill and the, i mean so we had to take it the overnight they took it onto into a warehouse basically rebuilt it in a warehouse and as we were shoot started shooting i had the painter still painted in the backdrop so that you had something out the window or not the doorway as they're sitting there but anyway, that was beside the point. It was a nightmare shooting it. But um, <laughs> um, no, but what I wanted with, 
uh, I wanted that kind of slightly white ghostly look in his face. I wanted him to feel like, yeah, a, yeah, a specter, a kind of ghost, you know? So it's kind of, I, I wouldn't, I was looking at it this time and then remembering that's why I did it. And I was thinking, well, is it that, was that too, too flatly, softly lit? So I don't know, but that's why I did it at the time. I mean, it's interesting you watch a film because I look at it now and I think, some of the, film, the scenes I really didn't like when we were timing it, mm. just from my point of view. Actually, I really like now, like in the theater, I think that ah, actually looks Yay. quite good. <laughs> and then, then I look at some others and get, oh God, you know, that's. <laughs> mm. Which ones did you not like before that you like today? Which ones did I not like before? Well, I said I didn't used to like the theater, but watching it this time, oh. the Chicago theater, I thought it was quite good. Yeah. There was there a wonderful exterior we did actually, but it's not there. <laughs> The opening has this beautiful montage of shots where he's walking like through the city, he's sitting at the table, it goes in the bar, it goes to the barbershop. And I'm wondering like, in terms of those kinds of shots, were those all shot listed or were those things that, that you gathered as you went? And it, it was, that, was that all planned out ahead of time? No, the first, the first shots where he's standing in the landscape and it, the sun's going down and then there's the fire. Well, we knew we were going to light a fire and they'd rig that. But um, that was a pre-production day. We went out in the field. It was just Andy, myself, um, our AD was there, Scott, I think, and, and, and Andrew and, and uh, Brad. And we were just in a field finding it, you know, and it was a wonderful, I thought it was a wonderful shot of the the corn stalks and there's a spider up there and there's Jesse smoking a cigar out of focus in the back. You know, they're just sort of found shots, really. Yeah, and I've read something once that said that um, you're kind of known for when there's downtime, just sort of grabbing a camera and getting insert shots or getting other shots that you sort of see. Um, how much of that happened on this set? was a bit on that but we had uh, the, the we had a, a second camera operator well it is his steady cam operating really uh, Damon Moreau and we would set him up you know in a room with a rocking chair and and you know seven frames a second just stay there all day and see what you get you know that that kind of thing send him out to shoot a sky as it was changing if we liked it and that kind of thing yeah so sometimes I would do it lunch times as well but I mean most of the time it was Damon working, you know, like um, just down the field from where we were shooting or something, you know, picking up something we'd seen. On, on that shoot too, the hours were really long, so there wasn't a lot of free time. Let's talk about the train robbery. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite sequences of any film. Um, I think what's striking about it is even before the train gets there, you have these incredible close-ups of like Jesse's boot on the track and like the rocks falling and then he puts his head on the on the rails it's just so beautifully composed and put together and then the light through the trees and how it you know it's sort of changing the shadows going across so I'm curious if we could just walk through some of those images and how you got them because in looking at them I, I don't know <laughs> like how did the, the the lights and the trees work and then I think also you know shooting through the sparks of the of the train yeah and if you watch it closely it's the same shot twice just to get a longest not longest bit of take in the film because we couldn't get we didn't get a very long take so he's just doubled it up and you never notice really but i noticed but you don't <laughs> no it, that was all storyboarded we knew he had to storyboard that Apart from some of the stuff with Sam in the train where we were following with a steady cam, but we, we knew we were, gonna fo we were following him with a steady cam, and then we just created some sort of shots at the time. But most of that build up and everything was storyboarded. And, and I was James saying, well, we, there was a whole conversation okay, how dark do you want it, Andrew? You know, is it okay if he's just like this face lit by this oil lamp and the blackness, you know, and then. You push in and there's nothing and gradually the light of the train comes along, you know. Um, yeah, so it's all sort of worked out. Uh, Andrew was really frustrated because that train is tiny. And Very he dinky. wanted a really huge, heavy looking train. So, I mean, the, the whole shoot, he kept bringing up how we had to shoot a toy train. <laughs> um, no, I get it. So the big thing was we, we, we can't light the train, but let's put a light on the train. 
<laughs> you know, which makes sense. It has a light, but it's much more exaggerated than the light that really was there. So we took the light that was really there off and put up a, a 5K par, you know, a tungsten par, which had actually just come on the market, I think, or very recently, really quite recently. And um, it's all on a yeah, remote dimmer, so as the train gets closer to the camera, the lights dim down, otherwise it would be blasting the lens too much, you know, and all that. And then, um, yeah, and, you know, you just kind of build on things. And But we were really lucky that um, on, on the night of the shoot, um, the wind was awful, and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to have to put some light on the trees, otherwise we don't know where we are, and that light on the train's not going to be able to be very bright because it will hit the lens too hard. And then gradually the wind went down, and I was putting some atmosphere in, or the effects guy I was getting was putting some atmosphere in, and it just, just the wind just died completely, so there was enough, a enough atmosphere that you could shoot into the light without it flaring the lens. And uh, yeah, so a lot of luck. Really. But to do the, when the gang are in the, in the forest, we didn't use the, the train to bring the light in. We, we had a platform, you know, that was one of those, well, no, actually it was a motor driven platform. So we put a light on that and so it panned because in reality you couldn't, the, the, the train light wouldn't have lit that far into the trees, you know. So it's all a lot of cheats, you know. It's a great cheat. And you know the um, dialogue between them when they're eating? That was all by oh, the, the actors, beginning, yeah. the ad improvising. So we had no idea what that was going to be. <laughs> wow. So and then the train pushing the camera. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, that was kind of like, okay, how are we going to do that? We'll have a platform car, and then we'll have a track on it. And as it gets there, we'll have a jib arm, and then we can pull back and all that. And it was all getting too much of a nightmare. And I said, well, we got, we got like 20 shots to shoot tonight, so. Um, just give me a piece of foam. I'll put a piece of foam on the front of the flatbed. I'll put the camera on a piece of foam and handheld it. And I said, if we get in trouble, I can pull the camera away. <laughs> 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 and the train hit the, you know, hit the foam on the flat car. There's a little bump, and off we went. It was fine. <laughs> just a little bump. Um, <laughs> We only have a couple minutes before I get to some of the audience questions, but um, I'm curious, there's so many frames in this film, and in so many of your films, that like your eye for composition, um, one of the shots that really jumped out at me, it's a really kind of a simple shot, but it's the scene after Jesse's crying when he's um, roughed up the cousin, the, little, the boy, and he gets on the horse and he rides up the hill, and you've got this like diagonal, horizon line at the top of the hill with the sun just over the ridge and then he rides diagonally across and goes right through the sun first of all like did you have like three minutes to get that shot <laughs> well you could just move to find where the sun was but then we, we would somebody was up the top of the hill to tell um i don't know it, i don't think it was brad riding a horse it would think it was a rider and some of the top of the hill just saying where to ride towards and then he disappeared ducked down and then the rider took it up towards the sun so you could you had some flexibility but we knew we were going to do that shot because it's a lovely little dead tree in the right hand mm -hmm. side of frame and then with the sun going down we, we knew that we knew that from from scouting the farm but that was kind of interesting because we wanted the snow so we had to build sort of a lot of flexibility into the schedule because we we wanted the snow at the end of the shoot, but we also wanted, you know, this kind of almost summery feel with the cornfields and stuff at the beginning. So it was a very difficult shoot to kind of schedule. And then the scene where um, Ed Miller is shot, you know, when it, that story flashing back to uh, Jesse James, Kenick, Ed Miller, we, we couldn't shoot that. We were snowed out in Canada. So we actually shot that um, north of LA in a big field, you know, uh, when we got back to LA, yeah. So in terms of your compositions, <clears throat> the other day I asked you, uh, did you get a chance to go out and shoot any photographs? And you said, I shot one and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I shot it really, but yeah, no. <laughs> so in terms of how you decide what your composition is gonna be, do you have an approach to what you're looking for for your frames, either in films or in photographs? 
I think it's very instinctual. I've seen you, you know, when you're trying to find it and we're about to go and then you move it slightly and and it's right. Yeah, I mean, it's not there till it's, you there. push the button, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, but you're talking about it a lot. You're talking about the, the, the storyboards. You're talking about what is it cut to. I think this is not thought about enough. You know, you shoot one shot there, you've got to know what you're doing on the turnaround or if you're doing a turnaround or if you're doing a wide shot. It's all part of the flow, so not one shot is standalone by itself, not many times anyway. All right, my last question before we get to some audience ones. Um, in working with the students this week, Roger, I heard you ask this a couple times, which I, th which I thought was really great. So I'm going to turn around and ask you the same question. <laughs> He's like, uh-oh, what's this going to be? Um, looking at this film, what do you like in your work in this film, and what are you unsure about? <laughs> Well, as I said earlier, I'm so unsure of some of the scenes now, how I lit them, and um, some of it I feel is quite overlit. But uh, actually, it looks, I'm, I don't mean to say this rudely, but on digital, it's not quite so overlit. It's the print is a <laughs> bit bright. Uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a very good print. It's a bit red, but anyway. <laughs> No, I kind of, uh, I'm sitting there, th I kind of, um, I don't really get proud of my work, but I'm really pleased to have been part of a film that I think is, yeah, it affects me. I was pretty torn up watching it. I was too. <laughs> All right, I have a few audience questions here. Um, oh. um, this is from Grant Dawson. He says, I'm a high school cinema teacher. Um, what are specific wow moments during your younger years that opened your eyes to what film can do? Also, any advice for young film viewers to become more empathetic viewers? I don't know, wow moments for me was, um, I was in a, a little film society in Torquay and they were showing a film, few films and they showed Peter Watts, Watkins' War Game and that was a wow, wow moment if you've ever seen that. Especially this was the 60s and we were all about to get annihilated by nuclear weapons. And also when you were seeing it, didn't two ladies faint in the Yeah, audience? they had to <laughs> cut it for a while because two women in the front row fainted. You know, they were used to watching, I don't know, Sound of Music or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> James, what about you? Well, I, I don't know how you become a more empathetic viewer. Either you let it yourself go and, and go into the film or you don't. Maybe watch better movies. I, I don't know. <laughs> I could go on about movies, but I, I, yes, I distinctly remember watching La Jete and thinking, you don't have to move the camera. Full stop. <laughs> and also, Once Upon a Time in the West is just so amazing because it's so, so... Good. <laughs> <laughs> And the music. There's so many, you know. I yeah. mean, come on, you know. Um, yeah. I remember watching Strange Love with my brother, and we we lived about five, six miles from town, I guess, five miles. And we were walking home in the rain, just singing Johnny Comes Marching Home. I mean, it was like, <laughs> wow, that was a real. They're all nuclear war stories, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> so something so, about you. It's a theme. Um, this question is from Lily. Uh, who are your favorite traditional artists, and have they influenced your shot design? Well, we like Edward Monk. Yeah, Edward Monk. Yeah, or, his composition or, um, is great. Oh, Edward Monk. <laughs> oh, Edward Monk. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Um, so this is from Carolyn and Matt. Uh, what makes you decide to work with a director that you haven't worked with before? And what has made you decide to work with them again? <laughs> um, well, I think passion. If they have a passion for what they're doing and you feel like they do have a view, because basically you're following the director's view. So if they're um, back and forth about what the movie is, that's not going to make a very good movie. So if they're passionate and they're not there, because of the paycheck, but they're there to make the movie. That's who we want to work with, basically. And I forget what the other question was. But, yeah, I mean, there's people you get on with and there's people no you don't. Way, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I 
obviously done films with directors I've not worked with a, se a second time. I mean, I couldn't say I got on with Andrew all that well. <laughs> um, at certain times, I mean, it's creative, creatively, you, you, you can come into conflict. I mean, we ended up fine, but uh, you know, I'm not sure we'd work together again. And it's nothing personal. It's just, it's you know, just people are different, aren't they? It's also when when you're working, you've got to communicate a lot, and you know that there are just certain people that you're trying to communicate with, but you're just on different. It's not levels, but different planes or something, and. It's and you just don't quite get what they're trying to say to you, and it's not their fault. It's probably your fault for not understanding. But you really have to have that communication if you're going to create something together. Also, I think a big thing for us, I mean, for me in particular, I suppose, is that I don't like to just shoot a lot of footage. Mm. I don't like to shoot with multiple cameras. Mm. I mean, okay, so. When I first worked with Joel and Ethan on Barton Fink, they had um, they'd called this director for a recommendation or not. And this director said, he doesn't like second units. He likes to operate himself. He doesn't like zoom lenses. He wants to shoot with one camera. What else did he have against me? <laughs> um, and Joel said to me years later, um, he said, you know, this guy said everything that he thought was like derogatory, but it was everything we wanted to hear of a cameraman. So it's just about, you know, finding the right collaborators, for sure. And, and zoom lenses. And, and zoom lenses. <laughs> um, so this is a question about Sicario, but I think it's a good question just in general. But this idea of how do you build tension in a scene with the shot. So they're talking about the border patrol scene, but I feel like that is such a huge part of this film as well. There's just so much tension. And when you're looking at the characters' faces, like who knows who's in danger, what's going to happen. So how do you use the frame to build that tension? There's so many different ways of doing it. And also in the cutting, if you hold a shot, that starts to make people tense. And you're going, oh, wait, why are we staying on this? No, I mean, <laughs> watch Tarkovsky's Stalker. I mean, the shots, there's nothing happening, and the shot holds and holds and holds, and it becomes so tense, it's all, it becomes hard to watch. Cause, and uh, it, it's really interesting, yeah. Well, but it's so much, isn't it? It's so much about performance, and the, you know, when you're on Casey sitting in the room there, and he's thinking about whether to shoot Jesse or not, I mean, it's like, yeah, it's so tense. I mean, so much. It's a combination of, yeah. yeah, performance and situation, and yeah, maybe it's framing and but the, the length of the, how 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 much you hold the shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you will push in, sometimes you pull back. That will create tension. It's 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 context. It, and and then for instance on prisoners, there's this one shot where the camera just pushes into a tree. Why? I mean, it's I'm got. I'm still asking that. Really. Yeah. <laughs> But it's got nothing to do with the scene, but it just adds so Anybody much. Anybody got tension. any ideas? What was it? <laughs> um, so, my final question for you all um, it's just been an absolutely incredible four days being with you, and I know that our students have gotten so much out of it. Um, I'm curious, just. Um, in, in your experience of working with them, because to me, I, I saw so much joy in you spending time with the students, and you sort of said this earlier, but I feel like it's about passion. Like, that's why you keep doing what you're doing, and, and sort of instilling that passion or, or um, you know, identifying that passion in yourself and in others and who you want to work with. Um, what was something that you saw in the last four days that surprised you or tickled you. I, I, one of my favorite things about this week, Roger, was seeing this little smirk that you get when something kind of tickles you. Uh, <laughs> and I saw quite a bit working with the students. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Because I feel like this is a huge part of who you are, is giving back. And we're just the lucky ones that get to be the benefactors of that. Oh, we get a lot out of it, too. It's wonderful to be able to talk about what you love to do and it was wonderful to talk to people that are so enthusiastic and had really good questions and um, it also makes you 
realize, because there were a lot of just set questions too that were asked and it makes you realize um, how much you've been through <laughs> and, and if we can um, warn someone against like, or tell them how to suggest something and not get s their head snapped off. I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's often the little things. What somebody do with the light and just mm. go. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming oh, yeah. and being a part of this. And sure. <laughs>